welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. The New Deal and An Honorable Profession just celebrated our second podcast anniversary. We've had so much fun bringing you the best of American leadership. If you haven't already, please check out some of our previous episodes with leading mayors, attorney generals, state legislators, and the thinkers shaping the future of the Democratic Party. Even in these difficult times, these folks keep me inspired about American politics, and I hope they do the same for you. Find out more at newdealleaders.org. Today's guest is in the middle of a political fight for America's democracy. North Carolina Senator Jay Chaudhry is fighting to make voting easier, as well as create more economic opportunity for his residents. He's the first Indian American elected to North Carolina state legislature. He's a lawyer, an educator, and a great person. He previously served as legal counsel to the state treasurer and attorney general, where he led major investigations and policy initiatives. We talk about how things look politically in his swing state, the response to COVID, how he's trying to help small businesses, especially restaurants, survive the pandemic, and why he serves. Enjoy. Senator Jay Chaudhry, welcome to An Honorable Profession. It's really great to be talking to you today. It's great to be with you, Ryan. Thanks for having me. So the world is looking at your state right now, North Carolina. It's a swing state. Uh, Could determine the future of the free world. How are things looking? Uh, no, no, no pressure, right? <laughs> um, yeah, they, yeah, we are um, we are a state that could uh, that could determine the presidency with our electoral college, um, determine the fifty uh, first U.S. Senate seat here, as well as a competitive uh, gubernatorial seat. Um, you know, I, I am cautiously optimistic about where things are headed. Uh, we have uh, four hundred thousand more Democrats and Republicans that have voted. Uh, thus far. Uh, Every public poll that has come out has put uh, Joe Biden ahead of uh, Donald Trump and uh, Governor Roy Cooper against his opponent, uh, Republican Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest, um, by even a larger margin. And if those trends hold, um, we should uh, we should be able to deliver the White House as well as uh, reelect Governor Cooper. And uh, from my perspective, also flip the North Carolina State Senate. Yeah. And I want to talk about that. North Carolina was also uh, sort of ground zero for the redistricting efforts after 2010. Um, how important is it, is it uh, that you win um, the state legislature and the governorship uh, for redistricting going forward? Well, I mean, number one, it is critically important that we elect, uh, reelect Governor Cooper to a second term, uh, just given his leadership and ability to veto bills. Um, as many of your viewers may or may not know, the governor of North Carolina actually does not have the ability to veto uh, redistricting bills. And so that, uh, in many ways, puts all the more pressure on making sure that we uh, flip both chambers, the House and the Senate. And, you know, from my from my perspective, um, given where we are with redistricting, uh, we had we had very successful uh, redistricting litigation that took place uh, last year um, that was uh, done through filing state constitutional claims. And, you know, based on the success of that redistricting uh, litigation, I mean, we're going to start with uh, 23 Senate Democratic seats and 27 Republican seats. Uh, that means that we really have to flip just three uh, Republican leaning seats to take back the majority. You've been trying to win both houses as well as the Senate and the governorship and the presidency with, you know, uh, pretty serious efforts to limit your voters ability to go to the polls and make their voice heard. Can you talk about the efforts you've made over the last couple of years to try to reduce voter suppression and make it easier for people to vote? Uh, yes, I mean, you know, the state has had uh, a long history that dates back to when Republicans took control of both chambers in 2010 to engage in uh, voter suppression, including uh, reducing the number of polling sites that are available, as well as to push for um, voter ID requirements. Uh, fortunately, you know, the courts have sided with many of the challenges that we have 
uh, presented in in uh, rejecting uh, in rejecting those provisions uh, over the summer. Um, Democrats were able to work with Republicans in fashioning a bipartisan election reform bill, and that was really the direct result of the fact that we broke the Republican supermajority in 2018 uh, that really forced the Republicans to come to bring Democrats to the table. And that reform bill has a number of um, uh, of very positive provisions, I think, that will help in making sure that we can get more people to vote. Uh, just as an example, number one, uh, there used to be the requirement that only uh, that an absentee ballot vote uh, required to to witness signatures uh, that that during a pandemic can be a huge challenge to overcome, because if you're an elderly uh, person living alone, uh, the idea of getting two witness requirements can be very difficult. We were able to reduce that to one witness requirement. Uh, we also, through this uh, legislation, um, continue to establish early voting sites and an uh, in in early voting time period. So our voters will have uh, 17 days to vote early. Uh, and then lastly, I would mention that you know, this legislation actually established an absentee voter portal in which a voter can simply enter their uh, voter information and be mailed uh, and, uh, be mailed an absentee ballot. So the portal essentially acts as a way to submit absentee um, ballot requests. And I, I really think that the portal uh, deserves a lot of credit for why we're seeing kind of a record turnout of early voting, not only with early voting sites, but also with absentee uh, mail, mail ballots submitted as well. If you are able to gain uh, the majority in the legislature or, or do bipartisan legislation, what kind of efforts do you think we need to make in order to just make our democracy function better? Uh, we're seeing long lines. We're seeing people really struggling to, to make their voice heard. What, what, what do you see? And ideally, it's something, you know, if North Carolina does it, other states can, can follow. What, what, what do you hope to do uh, if the election turns out, uh, you know, in our favor? Yeah, I, you know, I've been I've been giving some thought to that, given uh, some of the long lines that we've seen here uh, in in North Carolina. And I think it just as a core principle, Ryan, it's just important to make sure that we make voting uh, accessible without the barriers that have been erected by uh, my Republican colleagues. So I think uh, I think number one. Uh, we need to make sure that we remove any voter ID requirement for once and for all. Uh, number two, I think that we need to pass legislation that allows for more voting sites than we have in place already. Um, and number three, uh, to also make sure that we have automatic voter registration so that we get more people that are registered to vote um, so that we can expand uh, expand the ability of folks that are actually that can actually cast, uh, cast a ballot. Um, I, I think that too much of the Republican philosophy, in my mind, has been around uh, suppressing the vote. I mean, we need we need to uh, kind of adhere and embrace a principle that makes voting more accessible and easier. Couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, hopefully it'll be done both in states and also nationally uh, going forward. It's just we're often challenged to run government like a business. You would never make your customers wait two and a half hours uh, in the sun for uh, to do a 15 minute transaction. Seems like we could apply the same principles uh, to voting. I want to talk a little bit about your path. Uh, you were born in Chattanooga. You went to grad school in New York uh, where your wife was a prosecutor and then you came back to North Carolina. You were working as an advisor to, to the state treasurer and to the governor. What made you decide to uh, to go for elective office and actually public service generally? I'm sure you could have made a lot more money uh, with a lot fewer hours uh, if you'd stayed uh, in the private sector and just practiced law. Yeah, I um, I mean, look, I I will answer your question in two parts. I think uh, just my commitment to public service. I mean, I have uh, essentially spent my entire career in public service and an overwhelming majority of that career uh, in state government. And uh, really, you know, as I, as I think about it, it really comes from this notion of, of giving back. I mean, I, I do see public service as an honorable profession to, to quote your podcast uh, because 
when I think about my own parents' story, um, a story that is as is, is American as any other story in this country, as is, is immigrants who uh, came from India more than 50 years ago, um, coming to St. Louis, Missouri, uh, where they really just knew a handful of people, and how uh, through my father's hard work and uh, frankly, you know, the loneliness that my mother experienced who came to this country at a young age just through hard work and perseverance and uh, their decision to move to Fayetteville, North Carolina, where I grew up and uh, build a medical practice and ultimately give back. And, you know, that, that story is a story of uh, achieving the American dream. I mean, they've been able to pass on a better life to me and my children than the one that they had uh, for themselves. And, you know, when I, when I think about how fortunate and blessed uh, I am that our family is, uh, because of that story, uh, it is really what inspired me to go into public service um, to make sure that every North Carolinian has a shot at the American dream. Uh, I, you know, I primarily spent most of uh, my public service career um, working at the highest levels of all three branches of government. As, as you mentioned, I, I served as a senior counsel uh, to our state treasurer. I also served as a senior counsel to our um, the, the former attorney general who now serves as governor, Governor Roy Cooper. And, and those were amazing experiences. And ultimately, you know, I made a decision to run for public office uh, for two reasons. One is uh, a former colleague of mine at the attorney general's office, Josh Stein, was a current sitting state senator. And he was running for attorney general because the attorney general was running for governor. So it had a bit of a domino effect. But secondly, as I looked uh as I looked at the district, um, the district represented what I called uh, kind of old North Carolina and new North Carolina. It had uh, it had kind of the inside the Beltline neighborhoods near the state capital where I live, uh, but then it extended all the way to the western part of the district where you had a lot of new Americans and, and new immigrants. And I felt like I was an ideal candidate, not only because of my track record in state government, but because um, I could, uh, I, I felt very comfortable in both parts of the district. And you know, ultimately, I decided to run, and I I won. Um, I do. I will say that if I had not run, uh, if I had not won, I probably wouldn't have run again because um, I was I was also partly inspired by a column that David Brooks wrote in the New York Times. You may have read these, Ryan, called Life Reports, where he where he interviews um, Americans in their 70s, and he and he asks them questions about how what they would do if they could live their life over again. And the number one response from the life reports when I read that column back in 2015 was that they would take a risk. And so I took a risk. I mean, I took a risk. I, I left my job at the treasurer's office. I ran uh, for state Senate. I raised the money that I needed to raise. And then I you know, proceeded to knock on 7,000 doors. We did 40,000 doors as a campaign and 300,000 phone calls. And um, and then I got I got elected. I won my primary. And then Josh Stein uh, who then served as state as a state senator actually stepped down to run for attorney general full time. So I actually got appointed to fill out the rest of his term in 2016, right after the passage of House Bill Two, uh, which was the most anti-LGBTQ bill in the country. Wow, what a time uh, to to step into office! Uh, can I ask? I mean, I, I have a number of follow up questions, but the first one I want to start with is. Um, your experience as an Indian American. You're the first Indian American elected to the state legislature uh, in North Carolina. This is obviously a big year uh, with Kamala Harris, uh, hopefully being elected vice president of the United States. Can you talk a little bit about the Indian American experience in politics and really their sort of emergence uh, in American politics and what what you see uh, going on there, both in your state and nationally? I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's an amazing story that just, uh, I, I mean, in many ways, it's almost hard to process to see how fast, how, how many Indian Americans now are deciding to run for, for public office. You know, 20, 20 years ago, um, when I, uh, you know, my, my only gig outside of state government was working on Capitol Hill, and I worked for uh, U.S. Senator Russ Feingold. You know, back then there may have been one or two Indian Americans that just served as staff members. I mean, you could count uh, there was one Indian American elected to office, and that was it. Uh, and then to think that uh, 20 years later, um, I, that not only would I be serving as an elective office, but that we would uh, see that the vice presidential nominee for the Democratic Party as someone that comes from our community. 
it, it's it's hard to explain. And uh, in you know her her nomination and announcement by Joe Biden is a moment that uh, I will never forget. I, I I know my family will never forget because uh, I think as an immigrant community, I think we all strive to belong and see ourselves as part of the American mosaic. And that announcement, uh, probably more than anything else, kind of um, reflected that. And so I am excited about what her candidacy represents. And I feel incredibly confident that we will see more Indian Americans um, running for office, uh, hopefully as Democrats. Yeah. And sort of what do you think that, I mean, you're a child of immigrants, uh, you're a child of uh, Indian American culture. Uh, what do you think perspective that brings to your to your lawmaking and how you approach issues in the public arena? I think what guides me in decision making is so much shaped by my by my experiences, just as I think any immigrant is shaped by those experiences. And so I think they go uh, to this idea that uh, we want to make sure that we are inclusive and diverse and that everyone uh, has a voice when um, when we're making decisions. I think it's about making sure that we we set up systems and education systems that address uh, racial inequality because uh, as immigrants, we have seen education as as a way to move up the economic ladder. Uh, I think as a I think as a community, um, we also recognize the importance of health care. Um, we have a lot of members of the community that serve in the health care profession um, that are frankly on the front line of this pandemic. Uh, in fact, when the pandemic broke, I did a I did a number of roundtables with Indian American physicians around the state. Uh, but we we also see firsthand the importance of uh, addressing affordable health care. And so I, I think it's really the experiences that we bring uh, as a recent, as a as a fairly new immigrant community that shapes our our perspective on, I think, so many of the critical issues now that we're confronting uh, as a state and a country, especially with the pandemic. And I want to get to the pandemic in just a second, but I also want to talk a little bit about that experience. Uh, I imagine a bunch of our listeners are uh, political staff uh, advisors. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in that transition between being a senior advisor to elected officials to being the elected official uh, yourself? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. I think the public accountability obviously is the, is, is the most important, uh, important difference. And look, I mean, I ran for office, I think partially because I had developed enough confidence with the type of, work, you know, whether it was passing legislation or, you know, running a 50 state attorney general, multi-state on behalf of the attorney general, or, you know, settling claims against uh, investment managers that that have, that carried out alleged misconduct. Uh, I, I, I developed a lot of confidence in my ability to uh, carry those initiatives out. And, you know, I think that was part of the reason that I ran for office. Uh, but but you know the key difference is at the end of the day, right? Is that you that you've got to own it. I mean, it's your brand. Uh, you've got to make the decisions, and uh, you've got to put yourself out on the front line um, on 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 some difficult issues. And uh, I, you know, I think there are moments when I think back about my experience in the executive branch where um, I spent a lot of time kind of laying the foundation for really good work that took place. But at the end of the day. Uh, I didn't have to deal with the fallout of uh, of a press reporter, or um, or you know, frankly, just going to constituent meetings and, and and taking up so much of your time over the weekend. And, that, and that's not to suggest that you know, as appointed uh, or staff folks, we don't work hard on weekends. But there's just a degree of accountability that's 24/7 that I think is is much more different, I think, than being behind the scenes. Definitely, definitely a lot more chicken dinners to uh, to attend <laughs> on, on weekends. Uh, um, can you uh, can you talk a little bit about how your uh, family has uh, appreciated or not appreciated uh, <laughs> this transition uh, in your life? Well, you know, it's probably not a great question to ask right now this close to the election. But um, 
I mean, look, I, I, I think from my perspective, and frankly, I, I, w- I witnessed and watched a lot of this with, uh, with then Attorney General Cooper, now Governor Cooper, when I worked for him, uh, which is really that I think to be successful in politics, uh, I, I think there are two things. I think one is um, to bring your family along. Uh, as much as possible to, to, as part of that experience, right? So I, I think when there when there are opportunities to either bring you know my wife Sajel along to an event or bringing the kids to expose them to the importance of uh, public service, uh, we really try to do so. Uh, but then I think secondly, uh, what I what I also learned um, from you know now Governor Cooper is is the importance of protecting your time with your family and i i think that uh i i think politics and public service can have a real way of just uh sucking candidates into that 24 7 cycle um but for me i think it's it's important to kind of draw a mental uh divide so that when i'm with my family i'm with my family and uh and you know making sure that i don't uh, lose out on being a father to my two young children, I think is is probably just as important as it is to make sure that I'm providing the service to my constituents. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, I, in my experience, the kids don't always appreciate being brought to those events, but over time, they're having some sort of lasting impact uh, in the long run. I, I play the long game, right? We we, we hope so, right? <laughs> <laughs> Coming back to COVID, I want to, you've obviously played a significant role in trying to develop uh, your state's response, communicating with healthcare workers and essential workers. Uh, Can you tell us how it's going and um, what you're seeing for the remainder of the fall and into the winter? Yeah, I mean, look, with uh, with COVID, I mean, the numbers are steady right now, but certainly the projection is for the numbers to increase. I mean, I think I think just as any other state in the union, um, you know, the next eight to 12 weeks are going to be absolutely critical. And I I think, frankly, are going to be tough. Um, You know, Governor Cooper has still um, we're we're still in the phase where we have partial reopening. And I certainly guided by uh, by science and by his um, health and human services secretary, I think will make make adjustments accordingly in determining how much he will reopen or close the the economy. I mean, from my perspective, I really think that we should we should focus and think about worst case scenarios. And from my perspective, um, given the fact that that Congress has yet yet to pass a relief bill, I still I I think that there are many things that can be done at the state level. you know, unfortunately, with this General Assembly, uh, we were not able to do some of those things. And those things include, uh, first and foremost, making sure that we provide uh, relief um, and grants to our small businesses. I, I think it's critically important that government play a role to keep small businesses afloat while we get through uh, the pandemic, particularly those that are hit, that really kind of take it on the chin and those in the hospitality industry. I mean, I represent a district uh, that includes part of downtown Raleigh. So, I hear regularly from our businesses, from restaurant owners that are really, really struggling. So I think that's number one. And then number two, uh, which has really been a challenge, again, because of the leadership in this General Assembly, is uh, you know we haven't expanded Medicaid. And one of the things that really troubles me about the fact that we still we have yet to expand Medicaid is a recent study just came out that said that another quarter million North Carolinians have lost their uh, employer-sponsored health care. And so given the fact that we may be looking at upwards to 600 to 700,000 North Carolinians now that have uh, no health care coverage, uh, that I believe could be uh, that, that can be a key safety net for us to have through the pandemic. Um, it's, it's not only immoral, but it's, 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 uh, it's just, it's not the right thing to do for us to get through this pandemic. And so, um, so, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, Ryan, I still, uh, you, you see the ama- um, amazing resilience that people have, um, getting through this pandemic and, 
you, you kind of remain optimistic that we can get through it. But I just I just don't know how we get through this without providing uh, that kind of support in addition to the unemployment benefits that uh, so many states have played a key role in providing to uh, to the citizens here. There's so many aspects to this pandemic, and it really has uh, shown the the gaps in our system, including the healthcare system. You've been you've been very public about making the case for helping small business, especially restaurants, not only as a job source and a revenue source, but as a component to sort of life and culture, uh, especially in the South. Can you talk a little bit about what role you see for the government partnering with restaurants? Uh, to get them through this time in order to maintain, you know, the the quality of life that we we all want after the pandemic comes to an end. Yeah, I I mean, look, I, I think as a um, as a as a fellow Southerner, I think I, I think we all appreciate the role that restaurants play uh, in our communities as a as a place of gathering, uh, as a place of breaking bread and. Uh, I, I, you know, I worry. I worry about the fact that losing these restaurants also means that we're losing key cultural um, identifiers uh, for our cities and our towns. And you know, that's that's why it was important for me to to um, introduce a, a restaurant and hotel stabilization fund that would help these restaurants. Um, uh, again. Uh, a lot of this, this this idea was based on the notion, you know, it was based on principles of, of what they were trying in Congress, which, again, they haven't been able to provide the relief. So from my perspective, if there was a way to push similar legislation to the state level, uh, we would do so. And, you know, that, that legislation had key components. I mean, basically, I spent time with restaurant owners and we tried to look at their uh, P and L statements to look at where we could help with defraying those statements, right? So it's uh, it, it would provide grants to help pay for rent and utility. I mean, we looked at ways to deal with the Alcohol Beverage Commission so that uh, these restaurants would be able to sell back unused liquor uh, bottles, maybe that they're not using, and then also looking at ways to defray additional fees that they may incur from the state. Uh, so you know, again, from my perspective, I think as we get deeper into the pandemic. Uh, we ought to be thinking about you know, those industries again that are really taking it on the chin. And from my perspective, I mean, you got to start with the hospitality industry. That makes sense. And then I want to talk a little bit before the pandemic, you were a real leader in looking at trying to create an innovation economy uh, in North Carolina, to grow technology jobs uh, and create, you know, create good jobs in your community. Can you talk about those efforts and especially sort of, post-pandemic and hopefully uh, with a Democratic majority going forward, what role do you see for you, the state legislature, and Democrats generally in creating a new economy for uh, for both your state and the country? I think that the long-term recovery for the state and the country uh, with the pandemic presents some real opportunities. And I think part of that is also just rethinking uh, our economy and the innovation economy. I, I think that there are going to be a lot of opportunities to do so. Um, and, I, and I say that uh, because when I served as the general counsel to our uh, state treasurer, we were able to establish a quarter billion dollar innovation fund that was essentially designed to invest in, um, in companies that needed additional capital to, to grow. Uh, so I look. I think there. Are, I think there are a, a number of things that we can do. I mean, I think number one um, on this. Going back to the small business discussion, I am gravely worried about uh, communities of color. We know that more than forty percent of African American uh, small businesses, um, more than forty percent of Hispanic businesses, and immigrant-owned businesses um, have or will go out of business. And so the question is, what kind of access and capital can we provide? Uh, I think that there's a real opportunity, and I've been in discussions with folks about trying to set up entrepreneurship programs um, at HBCUs as a way to try to create um, entrepreneurship in, in those communities that have been hit hardest. Uh, number two, I think that we can look creatively to try to 
uh, make sure that we have capital that's available to invest in startups in our states. Uh, one of the issues that I was very interested in pursuing when I was at the state treasurer's office, and it was something that I would love to do when we take back the majority here in the Senate, is to set up what I call an entrepreneurship and education endowment fund, uh, which is essentially l- using the escheat fund, uh, the fund, uh, the unclaimed property fund, right? The deposits that we make to a utility or a bank account that we may not get back uh, that ultimately flows to the state. But in in North Carolina, uh, we've seen this unclaimed property fund grow to half a half a million dollars. In some instances, it could grow up to a billion dollars. When I was at the treasurer's office, I had the actuaries run what an unclaimed property fund would look like if we invested it partly in the market, and we also invested it in the startups without anyone touching the principal, which is something that the General Assembly has done. We can grow the unclaimed property fund uh, seven, eight, uh, $15 billion in in 20 or 30 years, which is an incredible amount of money if you think about uh, that can be not only be used to invest in startups, but also part of that money can be used to pay for scholarships in community colleges and universities. And then the last thing I would say Um, is we don't have a research and development tax credit, which is, I think, one of the, uh, I think, few tax credits that there's real empirical evidence that shows that works. Uh, And I think in in North Carolina, as someone that represents part of the Research Triangle Park, I think it's a real opportunity for us to grow uh, the R&D side and the innovation economy. And so, you know, I I would love to see those tools in the toolboxes we're looking at long-term recovery here uh, in the state. And can I ask uh, sort of the flip side of high tech? Uh, You were part of an effort to hold social media sites accountable for sort of enabling child predators online as as the both states and federal government look to take a, a stronger role in the in regulating social media. What lessons do you have for people who are uh, who are going to be taking up that fight in the coming months and years? Man, I, that, you know, that is a great question. Um, and the, the, the funny, so, you know, when, when I, when I served as special counsel attorney general, Roy Cooper, um, I, I led an effort of 50 state attorneys generals to look at the issue of child predators on, uh, social networking sites like MySpace, which is no longer in existence and Facebook, which was just emerging at that time. And one of the things you, you know, I discovered in the process is that it is, I mean, it is difficult to regulate those social networking sites um, at the state level. I mean, ultimately, uh, Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, which is now being revisited by members of Congress, uh, really kind of stands as a barrier in the in the ability to regulate um, internet sites. I, you know, I don't have an opinion on whether such regulation should take place at the federal level or not, except to say that I think that we ought to look at trying to put incentives in place to better uh, change the behavior of social, of, of internet sites and social networking sites and, and, and what they do. Um, I mean, that, that certainly was a start. I mean, part of what we had done um, through the investigation of the social networking sites was we we set up a task force uh, through the Berkman Center at, at Harvard University that essentially l- that did an assessment of the different types of age verification software that would be available. So, I mean, obviously one of the challenges uh, that we faced with social networking sites was underage children getting access to these sites that were then subsequently preyed upon by adults. I mean, I like that model, and I think that it's a model that we probably should revisit where, you know, either the federal government or the states get together uh, with technology companies and universities to do an assessment of what kind of safety tools there may be available or what kind of age verification or identification verification tools are available. Um, I mean, maybe that's a hard discussion to have because um, some users may feel the need to have anonymity, but from my perspective, if we're going to deal with the issue of disinformation uh, that seems to be uh, corroding parts of our democracy, I think we need to figure out other ways of dealing with verification to make sure that the information that's being that we're that that's being transmitted is both truthful but also holding those individuals accountable. I I, I like that approach. It's going to take these for very sort of nuanced. Uh, looks at the at the regulation in order to get any meaningful change. I think 
and it's going to take coordinated effort like you led across uh, across all the states. Finally, let me just ask you to make the pitch for children of immigrants out there, maybe particularly Indian American children of immigrants or all children, make your pitch for public service, right? Like as we talked about at the beginning, um, you you could have done a lot of different things, made more money, had a few, lot fewer people yelling at you uh, on a day to day basis, but but you you chose to engage in this life uh, and and build a real career out of it. Um, for those who are just you know just beginning their path, what's what's your pitch for what for why choose this choose this path uh, and take the risks that that you mentioned uh, from the David Brooks column. You know, I, I I would say that uh, I get up every day, uh, just as I'm sure you do, uh, excited about um, about the opportunity to to change the world. And I, and it and it sounds cliche, but even you know whether it's expediting an unemployment uh, benefit that a constituent can't get through, or being involved in recruiting a global information technology company that creates 2,000 jobs. I mean, those are amazing opportunities, I think, as new Americans that we can contribute back uh, to our community. And I think just being part of that can be incredibly, incredibly uh, rewarding. I mean, one of the things that I share with uh, second and third generation uh, Indian Americans is, you know, even if you are a doctor or an engineer, uh, there is an opportunity to serve, and it doesn't necessarily have to involve running for office. I mean, there are incredible opportunities to tap in at a point at a appointed level or a board to commissions level uh, that allows you to give back to your community. I, I, I think that you know I think our country only works best when we can tap into the talent that we have. And I think there's I think that we are having a real discussion about um, inclusivity and finding that talent. And I think that for the Indian American community, they should be just as part of that conversation and be at the table um, as any other community. And so, you know, to those that are listening, this is really, I think, the moment for us to uh, enter into the arena and serve. I like that. Come join us in the arena. It's, uh, it's never dull. We can promise you that. <laughs> that it is not. <laughs> Jay Chaudhry, thank you for uh, for joining us today. It's a pleasure talking to you. Uh, we'll all be watching uh, you and your state over the coming uh, weeks and months and hopefully uh, leading this country back onto a path of, of prosperity and health and opportunity. And I appreciate your leadership there uh, for, for both your state, but for all of us in the country. Thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, it's, it's great being with you today. Thank you. Have a, have a good day. All right. You too. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast. <laughs>